Hi, I'm here with Lisa Loud, formerly of BitMEX and PayPal. She has been around the crypto block for many, many years and even longer been engaged in online payments, as you can see from PayPal. And I recently hooked up with her after playing, I would say, at, at least a few weeks of phone tag and, and email tag and people saying we should meet. Have you heard about this? Have you met her yet? And, and did you guys yeah. finally hook up? And finally it happened at an event at, at the um, Crypto Tuesdays for Social Good event just the other night and uh, where I was so happy to be introduced by Lisa when I got to speak. And then I got to see all the great things she's doing and hear her talk about it first person, which made me really want to bring her on to the podcast. So Lisa, thank you so much for coming on and being willing to talk about some of the really cool stuff you've been doing in the blockchain and crypto space. Hi, Monica. Yeah, it's great to meet you as well. I've been looking forward to getting to know you a little bit better and uh, was honored to be able to introduce you last night. Um, it was an amazing presentation that you gave. I'm so excited to hear what you're working on. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you. But actually, um, gosh, I feel like I really got a lot of insight into what you've been working on, which was there's more overlap than we even realized, which is kind of neat. Um, I'm wondering if you could go into some of the first things you talked about with your presentation last night had to do, well, not just the stuff that overlaps, which we'll get to later in the real estate space, space which mm -hmm. is so neat, but mm -hmm. some of the interesting things that you were doing before you were involved in real estate. Yeah, um, well, I was raised by a mathematician, and so that definitely colors your view of the world as a mathematical place to live. And so um, I kind of naturally just gravitated into programming and um, coding. So I was a coder for Apple and Oracle, worked on some really interesting projects there. And um, then I ended up doing a startup on my own, which I'm sure we'll talk about in a little bit. But um, I think I really landed when I got to PayPal because PayPal was an exciting place. It was in 2008 when I started there. And I really felt like they were still pioneers in the financial uh, technology space and online payments. So were you on the coding side at PayPal or were you on the kind of front facing side? I thought you mentioned some also not just background on the deep math mathematical side of things, but also on the marketing side, right? Yeah, well, when I landed at PayPal, I had only done coding and I was hired there to be a technical program manager, which meant that I had to coordinate a lot of different groups. And actually, the reason I was brought in was PayPal wanted to launch a fully new Canadian site. There had never been PayPal Canada before then, and they wanted to launch this site, but PayPal is a very large and matrix organization. And so there were a lot of different groups, development groups and engineering groups that were trying to work together and they just, uh, they didn't speak the same languages. So um, I was brought in as kind of a, a communicator, a technical communicator <laughs> and project manager. And I managed to coordinate all of these teams together to launch PayPal Canada um, in 2009. So it took a couple of years to get there, but it was a really exciting project. I am also Canadian, so it helped that I had, I could speak Canadian as well as coding. <laughs> <laughs> Which means really just you spoke English more politely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We added A to all of the code, all of the uh, <laughs> Over sure. on, on the website. Yeah. <laughs> There are a few things, like in particular, check is spelled C-H-E-K in the U.S., and in Canada, it's C-H-E-Q-U-E. And Canadians are very particular about our differences from the U.S., so don't you dare assume that we can read check because we don't understand what that means. It has to be check with a Q. All right, so what if you just want to say, go check yourself? Yeah, that's fine. But okay. if, it's a, if it's a payment check, it has to have a Q in it. <laughs> Okay, just making sure because I'm like, well, if you refuse to read check with a ch or ck anytime, then would you be like, go check yourself? <laughs> it sounds like, hmm, I really couldn't write that. But anyway, not that that gets written too often. <laughs> yeah. So when you were doing technical pro management, I thought that you were also sort of doing some external marketing or messaging, but it sounds like it was really just like general communications plus being able to actually code and understand understand the technical yeah. side of things is just the right. sweet spot that you fell yeah. into. That is. And then because I was interfacing with so many different groups, of course, including marketing, 
um, I ended up showing an affinity for that group. And after the product was launched, um, they asked me to come on board in the marketing team. So that's how I made that transition. Oh, very cool. And how long did it take until you landed in the marketing team? Well, after PayPal Canada was launched, it was about two years, then I moved into a market, a fully marketing role in, um, at PayPal in 2009. Oh, very cool. Um, so this sort of overlaps with some of the other things you were doing that did not just go into the tech space. Is that right? Timeline wise, I thought, I think I was digging around and I saw that you had done some corporate yeah. housing by owner stuff, but that was sort of at the yeah. same time as some of this PayPal stuff. Is that, was that like, yeah. there was an overlap there where you were kind of one foot in, in corporate and one foot in entrepreneurial land? That's true. I uh, started a company in uh, corporate housing actually before I went to PayPal. And it was really exciting because it was before Airbnb existed. And I just saw a huge opportunity in, um, well, I owned a duplex and I had small children and I wanted to stay home with them. And so I saw an opportunity to use the other half of my duplex to support myself and, um, and stay at home with my kids. And what I did was I rented it out short term to people, executives who are coming into the Bay Area to work, you know, at large companies. So um, I think that I was kind of riding that wave. I was at the very tip of that sharing economy, but I was definitely riding that wave. So I find that I always tend to be somewhere in the, in the advance, um, the early days of things, which is why I was in FinTech, right? And now, then I was in uh, sharing economy for corporate housing. And then now, of course, I'm in blockchain, which is our next topic that I think we'll talk about. But um, yeah, the corporate housing business was really fun to see that develop while I was, um, while I was actually in that business and, and building a business for myself in there. And that ended up being um, carrying through the time that I was at PayPal. So I was doing it on the side while I was at PayPal and then I took some breaks from PayPal and went and did my business and then went back to PayPal. So I went back and forth a little bit. Oh, that's great. That is really interesting. Yeah, I think that most entrepreneurs really, uh, you know, people don't talk a lot about the other things you're doing on the side or maybe that are the bulk of your income when you're trying to start a new thing. And especially if you're, you know, as you were with corporate housing by owner and stuff, you were just at the very, very early days when, you know, you could do, be doing really well, but also the general adoption might be just so new that it's always a little iffy. So, um, yeah. yeah, it just doesn't get talked about a lot, just how many other things you're doing when you're an entrepreneur, you know, a lot of times people are like, and then she started a business, done. <laughs> it's not quite like that. Yeah. Um, well, that's very cool. So how did this end up sort of transitioning into BitMEX? BitMEX is, is the next evolution of this, of this yeah. nose you've got for new technology and, and where the market's leading, right? Yeah. Um, well, I think that PayPal originally was a leader in the financial technology space because they were creating, a, they created a new category called a payment facilitator, which didn't exist before PayPal. So uh, they made room for themselves by doing something different and by having a lot of adoption. So I think that adoption really drives regulation in some cases. Mm -hmm. In most cases, PayPal was able to get such a large customer base that regulators eventually decided, oh, we better make a space for them because this is clearly a need. But eventually I found that PayPal um, because as happens with everybody, like artists and musicians, if you get a good success behind your belt, under your belt, you don't want to risk that and you don't want to be the pioneer anymore. You don't want to be super creative. You want to be safe. You don't want to lose what you have. And I finally realized in 2017 that PayPal was never going to be the pioneer again and it probably wasn't a really good fit for what I wanted to do in my career. And so um, I had been talking to the, the people at BitMEX and uh, because I've been involved with Bitcoin since the early days, like 2013, I had mining rigs in my house. <laughs> and, uh, and I just, I loved the whole industry and I wanted PayPal to go into that, but it became clear in 2017. That wasn't really their mission. So since I knew um, people at BitMEX, I 
talk to them and they were like, you should come over. We need your experience. We need your marketing background. Um, come on over and help us build this. So I left um, PayPal and went to BitMEX, which was a huge risk at the time, right? Yeah, I bet. Because PayPal was well established and BitMEX was this, you know, this rebel in this rebel space. So my colleagues at uh, PayPal really thought I was crazy when I did that. <laughs> Little did they know you'd been uh, already running a side business anyway, so you were no, no uh, st stranger to risk, I suppose. Yeah. True, true, yeah. So how did your time at Bit BitMEX turn out? I mean, I know being with those new innovators and taking those risks sounds like it's more and more your style than than the alternative, but, you know, did you feel like it, it took a while to see that payoff? 2013 is an early time to be mining, but also, you know, moving over to BitMEX, and when you did, what was it, 2017, just, just mm -hmm. a, about a year ago? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, uh, um, yeah. how did that really, like, work out? It sounds like, I mean, we're in early days for, for crypto, but we're also, in, in some senses, especially as a miner, I can imagine you feel like this is a little bit old hat, too. Yeah, well, I think that it was very exciting. Um, such an exciting space. You know, the exchanges are all up and coming, and there's so much, um, there's, there's drama in the space. There's competition. There's, um, there's little rivalries going on. And so I just landed in this space, and I'm like, wow, this is the Wild West. So, but super fun and really exciting to see the business grow and grow and grow. Um, and of course, now we're in a different phase of cryptocurrency, right? But at that point, last year, things were just going up. And it was really an exciting time. I, I can't say enough about how much fun it was to be part of that team and to see things um, evolving and being successful. That's amazing. And so you stayed with them what, until just, I would say, just a few months ago. Is that right? Or when did you leave BitMEX? Yeah, and yeah, a little earlier this year, I left BitMEX, and um, uh, it was super fun to be with that. Um, I I decided to leave. I'm working on something that is more collaborative now. So, I, like I said, in, in earlier on with uh, with PayPal, I feel like adoption is the most important thing in any industry in order to gain acceptance and and legitimacy, and. Um, while the exchanges are doing a great thing for the industry by getting focusing media attention on um, on cryptocurrency, I don't think that they're helping as much as they could with adoption. So what I'm focused on now is a nonprofit that is very much focused on adoption because I feel like adoption, you know, blockchain in general, it has the the potential to um, empower people in developing countries. It has the potential to bank the unbanked, um, to provide to provide loans, micro loans in um, in Southeast Asia, for example, and United Nations food programs in Jordan. There's all these things that can happen with the blockchain and with digital currency. Um, but in order to legitimize the industry, I feel like we need to have a little better adoption. And so what I'm working on now is all adoption. And can you talk a little bit about some of the initiatives that you guys are looking at to, to sort of promote adoption? I think, you know, there are so few people that actually own any cryptocurrency. And of them, most of them are, a, a high majority of them are younger and younger, you know. So we've got early adopters that are in this, in this um, likely to adopt age group. But also, you know, it's not just those folks that are already um, on the cutting edge of interesting technology and, and with a youthful and with, a, with an appetite for it, you know, the real need for an entire crowd adoption that's not, not just the most likely suspects is, as you said, so important. What kind of innovations or um, initiatives are you guys developing to promote a broader sense of adoption in crypto? Um, well, I'll be able to talk about this a little bit more in a few weeks, but in general, what we're doing is trying to start a grassroots movement where people can share their cryptocurrency with other people. And um, I really think that's the way to do it because I've seen a couple of initiatives with education. And what happens is that when 
uh, when somebody who doesn't know anything, okay, I'm going to use my, my Harry Potter analogy. So okay. everyone knows the Harry Potter story where Harry is this muggle. He's an ordinary person living in an ordinary world. And he's kind of cramped, he's mistreated, he's kind of miserable, and he doesn't have any power. And one day he gets a gift, and his gift is an invitation to join the magical world of non-muggles. Um, and in accepting his invitation, he gets the chance to go to Hogwarts, which teaches him all about magic. It gives him a wand, it teaches him how to use the tools, and he's suddenly empowered and he has more freedom than he's ever had in his life. And I think that's what we're looking at with the world of di the digital asset economy. It exists all around us, right? But most of the world is still bit muggles, for example. We can use that word. Um, <laughs> that came up from last night. Somebody suggested that word. I love it. So the world is full of bit muggles who have no idea that cryptocurrency, digital assets even exist, don't know what blockchain is, and other people who have heard of it but still don't understand it. And I think what education does, if you, if you, if you provide education without the um, incentive, then people tend to get intimidated by it. I know somebody who's doing education in this space, and she told me that even if people pay for a class, They'll come to the class for the first few weeks, and then at some point, they'll just drop out because it's too complicated for them, and they don't see the payoff for themselves. Right. So a lot of the initiatives that I want to work on have a payoff. Um, it gets people engaged and um, motivated, so they're incentivized to do something about cryptocurrency, about digital assets, about blockchain. There's some personal benefit that goes to them if they learn about it. I can't say more yet, but um, I'm sure we'll talk again, and I can talk all about the, the actual mechanism that we wanna use to do this. But I do think that um, as we're thinking about adoption, we have to bring it home to ourselves and not say, someone out there needs to you know, make the world adopt Bitcoin. It's really us. We have to tell our friends about it and, um, and share it with them in order to get more people in the economy. That is a really good point. And actually, it, it kind of takes me back to um, another thing that you told me about yourself, which was really fascinating, which is that you you first had mining rigs in your home, mining cryptocurrency in 2013. That's a long time ago. So um, yeah. who told you? How did you learn that's, about blockchain? That's a funny story. So I, I know in the, a lot of engineers in Silicon Valley, just because I used to be one of them. And one of my friends, who's a complete engineer nerd, um, he said to me one day, um, your house is kind of cold. And I was like, yeah, my house is cold because it's California and we don't have insulation here. Huh. He said, well, I have this device and I'd like to put it in your house. <laughs> it doesn't make sense for me to run it at home because the electricity costs more than I get in, in run, for running it. But since your house is cold anyway, it can heat your house because it creates a lot of heat. And then you'll be paying for heating and I'll be getting Bitcoin. <laughs> so that's how I got into Bitcoin. <laughs> oh my gosh. Did you end up getting any of the Bitcoin? Yeah, actually I did. Eventually I understood what he was doing once, you know, it had been there for a while. And uh, <laughs> how long did it take until you were like, wait, I want more than the heating yeah. bill cover? <laughs> a few months. <laughs> a few months ago, I understood what was actually going on here. Wow, that's amazing. So um, so you were mining Bitcoin in, in 2013 or maybe early 2014, huh? Yeah, yeah, sometime around there. That's amazing. So from, from mining it, what other, at that point, where, what else did you see? Because, you know, as somebody who got more involved in, I mean, I first heard about Bitcoin probably in 2010, but I didn't see any reason to think yeah. about it, right? It was like yeah, thousands of pieces yeah. or something. It's ridiculous. But um, how did you end up you know, seeing the relevance of it? What was the, the use case that made sense to you? I did not see a lot of relevance to it. I saw that it was sort of like Dungeons and Dragons. Um, a lot of the a lot of my geek friends played it. And so, you know, I would play with them because I wanted to, you know, 
find out what they were interested in and participate in whatever they were doing. I, I think I have that sort of personality that I always want to find out what people value. Like I hate sports on TV, but I notice that a lot of people really love them. So sometimes I watch a game with them just to understand what they see in it. And I think that was all I had for Bitcoin. I didn't have a passion for it at that point. I just saw that some of my friends were really passionate about it. So I wanted to see what was going on and learn more about it. Oh, that might be the biggest takeaway yet. Like just if you want to be on the cutting edge of, uh, uh, of what's happening, it's not a matter of cultivating all the interest yourself, but just cultivating the curiosity for interests that you wouldn't actually possess exactly. to increase your likelihood of being exposed to the thing that is the next big thing. Yeah, and I don't think I was that um, intentional about, you know, finding out what's the next big thing. It's more just trying to be open-minded so I can understand other people. I like, to, I like to be able to understand what motivates people, even if it doesn't motivate me. That's and so it's more, it's more just wanting to understand people better. Wow. Wow. That makes a lot of sense. And but it has paid off, right? Because yeah. Right. That's a, you've got a lot, a lot of good payoffs. I mean, you've been in, in so many early, early times of, of uh, various different industries mm -hmm. and, and, you know, somehow following your nose this way is really working out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's true. It's a side benefit. Yeah. Right. Do you still uh, put to work any of the mathematics and uh, the math brain that you inherited? Mm -hmm. Is that still a big part of what you're doing or do you feel like the marketing brain of yours has sort of taken over with the more nonprofit focus? Mm -hmm. No, no. Um, yeah, if I ever do something that doesn't have a, a technical challenge to it, I get bored pretty quickly. So <laughs> one reason I loved the Bitcoin role was that, uh, sorry, the BitMEX role is that because it's a derivatives trading platform, I had to learn a lot. And I mean, it made sense to me from the mathematical side, but I had to learn a lot about how trading works and how derivatives work and how leverage. It's not that I hadn't traded before, but I really got into it. And it's very mathematical, right? It's statistical. Um, so understanding those concepts was, was really fun for me. And now what I'm doing is um, it, the, uh, the nonprofit that I'm working on, it has a mathematical component to it, right? How does adoption actually work? And how does, statistically speaking, how do you promote adoption? Um, so I think that aspect of it always has to be there for me. That makes a lot of sense. Well, with that, I feel like we've kind of hit the, hit the most amazing stuff. I wish we could talk more about what you're doing right now, but I realize mm -hmm. it's still a little bit in stealth mode. So you're going to have to come back onto the show and tell us about it in a few weeks after you've unveiled this. Because Definitely, I would love to. I couldn't agree more that we really need we, we really need more initiatives to get mass adoption into crypto. That's why I wrote my book. That's why, you know, we're I think um, it's the biggest need that we have at this point. Yes. Good. Let's talk more soon. Yeah, for sure. Well, um, where can people find you on social or online? Any uh, links or anything like that? Yeah. I'm happy to include in our show notes, but okay. also, if you have any like a handle that you want people to check out or anything where you are publishing often, please plug it. Okay, uh, I do have a blog, it's called disruptive.finance. And um, I, t I write about generosity in the digital asset economy and about women in blockchain. Those are my two pet topics, really. I love it, I love it. D disruptive.finance, for sure. We're gonna put that in our show notes. And just thank you again, Lisa, for making the time. Is there anything else you wanna um, plug or let us know about before we sign off? Not yet, but soon. <laughs> All right. I can't wait. I can't wait. So we'll hear from you again soon. Thanks okay. again for coming on. And I will be sure to, um, to be sharing this whole thing with, with Tracy. We're going to have a, a recap soon over all of our, of our um, conversation. And I'm sure she's going to have some things to add to the tail end of this. So thanks okay. so much, Lisa. Thanks so much for inviting me, Monica. It's great to talk to you. Great to talk with you as well. Bye-bye.